Welcome to section 2.27 and 2.28. So in this we're going to discuss the first and the second steps of aerobic cellular respiration. Now just to be clear, glycolysis, the first step, is the first step in any type of cellular respiration, uh, at least that we're going to talk about, which is breaking down glucose. So both anaerobic and aerobic will use it. Now if it's aerobic, so if there's oxygen present and we're using the oxygen, we can then move on to the Krebs cycle. Now the picture here, and the reason I have this, is for a couple of reasons, I suppose. First is to make sure you realize this is a biochemical pathway, which means it's got multiple steps. This is not like a one quick thing where glucose ultimately just splits apart and becomes pyruvate, because that's overall what's happening. But I want to make you guys realize that it's a whole series of steps that involve a whole series of enzymes. It's much more complex than what we will ultimately represent it as. You know, we're going to try to focus on, once again, where does it happen? What comes in? What do we get out of it? because it's very complicated. But if I give you a chart like this, I also want you to be able to interpret it. So if you see something like ATP here that's being converted to ADP, that means it's being used. So this is essentially saying minus ATP. And if we see something over, as we move along here, over here we see ADP becoming ATP. So this would essentially be plus ATP, we'd be adding it. So I want you guys just to be capable of reading something like this. So if I give you the chart and say I want you to extract information from it, you should be capable of doing that. Now as we get into the actual details a bit more, glycolysis will occur in the cytosol or cytoplasm, which one you refer to it as. Uh, I'm not really going to harm you on that one, but cytosol is what I prefer. This is going to be a fairly universal process. This has been going on for a long time in organisms. Just about all organisms use this because most organisms can break down glucose. So this appears to be something that evolved early on and then has been kind of passed on to pretty much all organisms so that they have it. And once again with this universality, this can also occur whether you're anaerobic or aerobic. So even organisms that live in environments that don't have oxygen uh, which would be a lot like early earth environments, they would still be capable of doing this. Now, in this process, what we're going to do is essentially take a glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, and we're going to break it down, uh, essentially split it in half, ultimately, into two three carbon pyruvates. And so it, it seems like there's a lot of steps for something relatively simple, but this is what it comes down to. So we start with glucose up here, we end with two pyruvates here. And in the process of this, we're going to use two ATP, so we're essentially minus two ATP to get it going. And then once we get it going, it will release four ATP. And so that means overall we have two net ATP. So we kind of spent two dollars, but we got four dollars in return. So we're still up but we're only up four, even though you might look at it and go, hey look, four, great. No, you had to spend two to get that. So two ATP is what we get. If you're doing anaerobic respiration, then you're done. This is the two ATP you get, that's it. Uh, but if you're doing aerobic, we still have these two pyruvate molecules, which still have three carbons. Uh, so these ones still have plenty of energy in them, so we can extract more later on. And we also will get two NADHs. Now these are kind of interesting because they have the ability to let us using the electron transport chain, uh, they have the ability to let us make about three ATP each, but only if we can use the electron transport chain. And that only works if we have oxygen. So if there's no oxygen, this guy is actually kind of a pain in the butt. We don't really want it around. If there is oxygen present, this guy is very useful. So NADH is kind of interesting where you have to figure out if it's aerobic, it's an awesome molecule. It lets you make tons of energy. I mean, there's six ATP worth of energy right there. However, if it's anaerobic, it's actually a liability, and we're going to have to figure out some way to get rid of it because we have to have NAD plus to do glycolysis because NAD plus is being converted into NADH. So if we don't have NAD plus, we can't do glycolysis. So if we have too much NADH sitting around, it actually causes a problem. The next step we have is the Krebs cycle. Now this will occur in the mitochondrial matrix. So pyruvate is going to essentially travel from the cytosol and into the cytosol-like part of the mitochondria, so the innermost cytosol-like substance, uh, and we just call that the matrix. And so this will be a cycle because it starts out with oxaloacetate, just a particular molecule, you don't have to know much about them, uh, and that ultimately at the end of this process you end back up with oxaloacetate, we regenerate it. So that's why this is a cycle. 
the guy that binds the first molecule is what we end up with at the end, so it's ready to bind another molecule. So it's like using a bucket where you can get the water, fill up the bucket, dump the bucket, and you still have the bucket. You're ready to get the next you know, bucket full of water. Now, in this process, I'm going to kind of lump several things that happen here because the Krebs cycle technically takes a guy called acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon compound, and breaks it down into two CO2s. Right? So it's, it's ripping what was our sugar down into carbon dioxide. But there's technically a step that occurs right before this, uh, we, right before you go into the, the Krebs cycle, where pyruvate, which is a three-carbon molecule, gets converted into acetyl-CoA, a two-carbon. And that also will release CO2, and it'll also release two NAD pluses. So we get some more of these guys. And if we want to, you'll see the numbers get interesting. Technically, there's two pyruvates, so we have two three-carbon molecules, which give us two CO2s total, one each. So each pruvate gives us one CO2, one NADH, and one acetyl-CoA. Because there's two, every time we get a glucose and split it, we're now working with two pruvates. Just keep in mind, that's why there's two of each of these things. So technically, there's two acetyl-CoAs. And technically, there would be four carbon dioxides produced at the end as I break down acetyl-CoA. I'm not going to go crazy with numbers when I'm actually giving you quizzes, so don't get too caught up with this. But for those of you following along at home here, uh, I'm trying to make sure you realize that the math does balance out. You know, we're taking two three carbon compounds, which is a total of six carbons, and we're ending up with six total CO2s because we're getting two here when we're doing this pruvate to acetyl CoA, and four here when we do the Krebs cycle. These two NADH, though, we'll save for later. Now, the Krebs cycle itself, which is this step, acetyl CoA to CO2s, is going to generate for us about six NADH total. Now remember, we're doing this twice because we're doing this with two acetyl-CoAs per glucose. So per glucose, we'll get six, two, and two. If we're doing this per acetyl-CoA, it would be three, one, and one. And once again, I'm not gonna go crazy with numbers, but I just wanna make sure that it jives with you if you're sitting here doing the math in your head. So the purpose of this process is just breaking down the sugar and trying to build these electron carrier molecules. That's really what we're after here. We're getting very little ATP. So for the ATP, you can kind of set that aside and not worry about it too much. Uh, it's not much difference from two to four ATP total. However, we've just managed to make two NADH here and six here. So we have a total of eight NADH we've made as we're going through this Krebs process, as well as the two that we'd already made from glycolysis. So that's a total of 10 NADHs. We also made two FADH2s, which can be used also by the electron transport chain. So the electron transport chain, if there's oxygen to use it, can actually convert all of this stuff, these 10 NADHs and two FADH2s, they can be converted into a total of 34 ATP. You can make three ATP per NADH and two for every FADH2. So there's a lot of potential ATPs stored by getting all these electron carrier molecules built, by adding the electrons and the H pluses to assemble them. So that's really the purpose of the Krebs cycle. It's not directly making us a bunch of ATP, it's only making us a little bit. It is, however, getting us a bunch of these molecules to power the electron transport chain, which can make us a boatload of them. So just kind of keep that in mind. So a quick review, glycolysis and Krebs, both of these are going to be about breaking down glucose to get it into CO2. We have that kind of middle step here of pyruvate, because we go glucose to pyruvate, then the CO2 using the Krebs cycle. But this is our overall goal of these two processes together. Now, in this process we talked about, we will make some ATP. Glycolysis gives you about two, Krebs cycle gives you about two more. But the bulk of what we're after here is all those NADHs and FADH2s. We're after those electron carrier molecules that carry enough energy not to give us two to four ATP, but ultimately to provide us with 34 ATP. So you can see that's where most of our energy is still at. So we've kind of transferred this energy from the glucose, from the pyruvate, and we've kind of stored it on these NADH and FADH2 molecules. And that wraps us up, and we'll pick up with what we do with NADH and FADH2 in the next podcast. See ya.